to introduce to you some of our environmental heavyweights from Alliant Energy, and I am an Alliant Energy employee, I might, might add, full disclosure. <laughs> so we have Steve Jackson, we have Michelle Pluta, and Joe Hawk. The topic they're going to be speaking to you about today is connecting environmental compliance to responsible resources. Thank you, Mark, and thanks to everybody for the invite. We appreciate it very much. Uh, we don't often get out and, and give a lot of detail on some of the things that uh, we're working on, but uh, again, we appreciate it. Um, we were thinking originally of getting, like working out here and walking around, but this seems to work okay. Everybody hear me all right? Okay, good. Um, we hope to give you a little insight of, of some of the major environmental rules that we're following. Um, and how they fit into how we do strategic planning um, and, and work through our resource plan. Um, I, Mark introduced me, I'm Steve Jackson. I manage the environmental services group that is responsible for planning. We look at emerging rules. Uh, we put together strategic plans, budgets, um, and as we like to joke, our work is done in decades uh, because a rule starts 20 years ago and through litigation and all that that takes place in rulemaking, uh, here we are 20 years later actually doing something like constructing uh, pollution control equipment or uh, reaching some new compliance goal requirements. So um, I've been with Alliant for 20 years, um, so I can kind of say our work is done in decades. I've actually seen it. Um, and we'll introduce ourselves. Joe or Michelle, would you like to introduce yourself at, at this time? Sure. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Steve is our, is our boss at uh, Alliant. Uh, we were in the planning group there, Michelle and I. Uh, before I came to Alliant, I spent five years at the Wisconsin DNR and probably know somebody in the audience, some of the work I did with uh, that agency. And I've been with Alliant now for the past two and a half years and it really is a great place to work and you know, the company has a really good commitment to the environment and looking out for its customers so we're happy to, to talk about uh, some of the environmental rules we're looking at today and happy to answer any questions so you know we want to keep this open so if there's something you don't understand or you have a question on just raise your hand we'll try to stop as we go through this to take questions as well. Good afternoon. I'm Michelle Pluta, and I've been with Alliant since about 2001. Uh, prior to working at Alliant, I uh, worked mostly in the Wisconsin area uh, at a consulting company working for a lot of the industries in this area and throughout the state. So um, I'm not sure what else anybody would like to know. I have some roots in the Sheboygan area, Sheboygan sausage. So. <laughs> I've had Sheboygan sausage as well, so, but, <laughs> but no roots. Uh, so, uh, oops, I, there we go. As Joe mentioned, we'd like to keep this open, so we are uh, willing to answer any questions you have. We'll do our best, I should say, to answer any questions you have. Um, we, like I mentioned earlier, we want to kind of talk about our strategy and talk about how we do environmental planning and, and how we make things happen within the uh, generation, what we call our generation resource, but we are now calling responsible resources because as we'll talk, uh, what used to be a lot of coal-fired generation is uh, changing quite a bit. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in one of the slides. Um, but we plan to talk about the Clean Power Plan, uh, Ozone National Ambient Air Quality Standards, the coal combustion residuals rule, uh, effluent limitation guidelines, and water quality standards kind of in general. Um, we do talk a lot in, excuse me, in acronyms, so we'll try our best not to do that for you because uh, we're kind of technical nerds in that way um, with the acronyms and, and it may not be familiar to you. So, And uh, if you are a technical nerd, great. Let me know. <laughs> You know, raise your hand if you're a technical nerd and you know what NACS means and, you know, we'll talk, try to talk in those terms for you. Um, so like I said, we're prepared to answer any questions you have, uh, but we're not prepared to like dive deep into some of the regulations. We want to kind of keep it high level, 
to keep it more interesting. Otherwise, it can be long and tedious, and, and you just ate lunch. So, um, is there at this time? I'd like to ask: Is there anything specific that you didn't see up here that you might like us to cover? Should we have the time? Yes. Okay. I'm not going to answer that right now, but we'll we'll preserve it for later. <laughs> it's a good question. Any others? Now you see where I'm going. We're just getting the information, but I'm not going to answer the question right now. All right, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Michelle. She's going to hit the next slide. Okay, so we wanted to talk a little bit about how we go about environmental planning. And as I mentioned, um, I'll maybe start with just um, an example. I've been with the company since 2001. And uh, when I started, um, one of the issues I, I began working on, and we're not talking about today, really, because it's a, a success story, um, is mercury and mercury emissions reductions. And, and really, it's a good example of how we we think about you know in the long term how we can go about managing environmental compliance um, when we look at an environmental planning and, and our perspective um, we kind of take a very long-term approach um, but we also we make sure to balance it make sure it's pragmatic um, and we we take our time to make sure whatever we're doing will make sense both in the short term and in the long term so for an example, when we, we started working on our mercury reductions, we did a lot of testing in pilots. Um, some of those pilots were done uh, at our Edgewater uh, generation station here and just understanding technology. And so by doing those types of things, we can figure out how to uh, leverage uh, the results, which results and which types of technologies might work well. Um, at the same time, um, for example, in Mercury, we had a state Mercury role. There was also a federal role that actually um, finally took compliance this year. Um, <clears throat> we have to make sure that we can uh, expand upon those technologies. So we started with kind of uh, a dual approach, looking at both kind of uh, smaller scale technologies, but those that would work with larger scale technologies. So kind of in the long run, what we ended up is a federal role that replaced a state role. Um, and kind of a group of technologies we're using together now that has over 90% mercury reductions. So that's an example of, you know, taking that bigger picture review when we implement a rule. And throughout that process, I would say even um, the rules change several times, <laughs> and we actually just uh, are getting some, some closure on the mercury rule from the legal standpoint. But needless to say, you know, we, we focused on kind of the long-term objective. And so I think that's just a good example of how we kind of um, plan for the future. We don't, we don't uh, wait to the last minute, um, but we also don't put the cart before the horse and try to over-design. So, so kind of looking at that bigger picture and knowing things may uh, kind of uh, be in flux. Um, the other thing I would say is that we're continuing to monitor rules and regulations and trends and as those change over time and that helps us to kind of look at what might be coming down the pike, um, how we can look at things not only from uh, an air emission stand, standard uh, but also looking at water and the solid waste impacts. So we're, we're looking at it from a broader multimedia perspective as well so that we uh, also don't create uh, another challenge down the road um, when we're, we're putting in some type of a, a control or putting some measures into place. Um, so, so that's kind of in a nutshell kind of the bigger picture <clears throat> of how we look at things. As we see new rules coming down, we work pretty diligently to provide uh, comments to our regulators on ways to help inform them on what will be feasible um, technically, um, what will help reduce costs, and more than anything else, we're trying to make sure we have some level of planning certainty, um, which is kind of hard to come by these days. 
Uh, so we have been uh, pretty diligent in offering comments to our regulators, the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, and others on the bigger picture of, uh, you know, you've, you're going to ask us to do this, but this is what we need to do. And if you do it this way, that helps us um, to have some flexibility and some certainty and balance and reduce the cost for our customers. So that's, that's a very important thing for us when we look at all of these. Any questions? Can you touch on the subject matters and our partnership, some of our partnerships? Like oh, yes, absolutely. So um, we work quite closely as well with our trade groups. Um, uh, and for example, the Electric Power Research Institute is uh, one uh, national organization that helps us with many of the studies that we do on the technology uh, to help us understand you know, what will will work effectively and so we leverage those partnerships also with um, trade groups, Edison Electric Institute and others uh, to help kind of uh, make sure nationally and also at the state level uh, that when we have things come, come together that um, we are able to inform our regulators of the best solutions. Okay. And next Joe is going to talk a little bit. All right, so Steve had mentioned you know, t times there are changing. Uh, that includes our fleet. Uh, you know, we, we used to have uh, you know, a lot of coal generation. Um, we still see that as a piece of the puzzle moving well into the future. There definitely is a place for that. But our, our fleet has been in a state of transition. You, know, you brought up the question on nuclear. You know, we can get back to you and see if we've taken a formal company position on it. But nuclear has always been the, kind of a piece of our pie as well. We've always tried to have a, a balanced portfolio, if you will, and we always look at what's in the best interest of our customer and meeting our demand while meeting our environmental commitments. And this just shows uh, over time, at least back to 2007, looking into the future, how our fleet is changing. And this is based on the size of the units, not necessarily how they operate, but what we call nameplate capacity. To give you an idea of kind of the scope of these these pies, so the the, nu the nuclear piece there is a, a nuclear facility which we have a, a purchase power agreement an agreement to purchase the power from Dwayne Arnold Energy Center in Iowa. We, we used to have one uh, with Kiwani here in Wisconsin until recently. Uh, that nuclear piece is about half the size of the Edgewater generating station which I would note, um, you know, we have the plant manager here and a couple others from the plant, so you know, they have a great team there, and any questions specifically about the plant, you know, more than happy to drag them up here. Uh, <laughs> but um, you know, just to give you a, a, an idea of you know, what these pies are showing, that nuclear piece, about half the size of what's over at Edgewater there. So uh, we do use this term responsible resources because I think we've done a really good job of making reductions, transforming our fleet, positioning ourselves well. So when various rules come along, whether it be the mercury and air toxics rule or DNR um, NOx, nitrogen oxide rules come along, or even clean power plan, we're pretty well positioned uh, to meet some of these rules and um, engage with some of the agencies, as Michelle has, has noted. And one of the things I really like about the company is, I, at least I found that we're really respected out there um, on all sides of the aisle. And we, we try to make informative comments on these rules, and that, that helps as well, I, I believe. So um, going in the future, you can see um, our plan is to, any coal that we have, to keep it, um, but focus on our biggest, most efficient units, improve efficiency at those units. Uh, we recognize that if they're going to stick around for the long term, they're going to have to be fully controlled, and we've made a lot of investments, and we continue to do so. As an example, just over at Edgewater, just this year, we'll be finishing up another major air pollution project there. Um, and as a company, we're looking at some of these key pollutants, reducing them anywhere from 80 to 90 percent, just dating back over the last 10 years. So really, really impressive emission reductions while maintaining um, costs at a reasonable level for our customers. Yeah, so we're really, you kind of think about three or four type major pollutants, uh, nitrogen oxides, NOx being one, SO2, sulfur dioxide, mercury, and then particulate matter. So those are some of the four major pollutants that we're looking at. So when we say partially controlled coal, we're thinking maybe we have a box for one or two of the pollutants, whereas fully we're controlling the whole 
complete the whole you know, for the set of pollutants. So yeah, um, really a kind of exciting times, and you know, we're in the process of building a new state-of-the-art um, combined cycle natural gas plant in Iowa. We've and we've proposed to expand our Riverside Center down in Beloit, um, our combined cycle natural gas plant there. So, and so our, our fleet is really changing, and we're also getting involved more in renewables. Um, you know, we're, we're expanding our, our wind in Iowa with, through purchase power agreements, and we're also getting more involved in solar. We're doing a lot of exciting things with solar, putting solar on some of our old coal landfills. Uh, we're putting solar at our corporate headquarters. We're doing um, pilot projects with uh, different uh, nature centers and schools. So just really exciting times for, for the company. Any questions on how the fleet's changing? Uh, this is the last chance before we start getting into some of these rules. Yeah. And I think I'm going to take the next one, which, uh, or no, it's actually a clean power plan, which uh, no shortage of stuff to talk about. So Michelle's going to walk us through that. Okay. Actually, I've, I've, I'd like to just ask if people wouldn't mind a show of hands of anybody here who's at least heard of or read about the clean power plan. A good, uh, pretty much everybody, almost, yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Um, that's helpful just to know. Uh, it's uh, carbon reductions in the clean power plan uh, is probably the the one on the forefront for us right now. As as we've discussed, we're working through a lot of our other emissions reductions uh, and successfully doing so under that fully controlled coal block. Um, and so now uh, we're looking at something that's focusing on our carbon dioxide emissions. Carbon dioxide emissions will come from our fossil fueled power plants. And the one thing I would say about that is that with CO2, carbon dioxide being CO2, making sure I'm good about that, um, it's different. Um, it does not have that. We, we have different control technologies that we can work into our plants and uh, effectively reduce those other emissions. With carbon dioxide, it's not that easy. There really isn't a great commercial technology out there that's been proven to help us achieve those reductions. And so uh, what we have uh, that came out this year is the Clean Power Plan. And uh, the Clean Power Plan, um, essentially it's going to be a, a statewide goal that will uh, affect us, uh, our fossil fuel power plants, and those in, in the state and nationally. And um, what those guidelines will do is to ask us to reduce our carbon dioxide emissions across the state. And so it will be uh, a national but requirement, but it will f affect each of our, our fossil fuel units. And that's essentially our coal-fired units and certain of our uh, combined cycle natural gas units. Uh, with the guidelines, what we'll need to do is look broadly on how we can make reductions. Uh, in terms of uh, timing, uh, the development of these plans to achieve these goals uh, will be due uh, in fall of 2018. There's a, a variety of step periods in the planning process that occur before that. And the reductions will need to occur starting from 2022 uh, through 2030, and then they step down. Uh, for a final goal that begins in 2030 and beyond. Uh, in terms of overall reductions, uh, these goals are going to have a 30 to 40 percent reduction uh, from a baseline level that EPA proposed, which was tw the year 2012. Uh, as I mentioned a little bit in terms of carbon dioxide, it's different, and we can't just decide to add this technology. And so when we talk about the Clean Power Plan, what you have is a rule that we call uh, something that goes beyond the fence line, literally meaning beyond our power plant fence line, because how we will get these reductions will be some actions at the plants, but it will also be in changing how we operate and then different employing different types of uh, energy resources, uh, such as renewables, to help kind of reduce the carbon footprint of our fossil plant. So it's going to be kind of a, an array of measures that we will uh, work together to make sure that we have a lower CO2 footprint. At the same time, we have to make sure we balance out those actions to make sure that we're ha providing you with a, re a reliable source of power, um, because not all of the technologies are there 
like Edgewater as a base load power source. Uh, more broadly, so what we're doing uh, in terms of achieving these reductions, um, as I mentioned, there are some things we can do at our plant, and to a large extent there are things we do anyways, and that's improving the efficiency of our fleet, and we've worked very diligently to do that, and we continue to improve it. And essentially what we're doing there is making sure, just like your car, uh, you try to have an efficient car, more miles per gallon. We're trying to run our units the same way so we get more energy produced uh, for each unit of fuel that we're burning. Um, we're also retiring, uh, as we talked about with the re responsible resource strategy, a lot of the smaller, less efficient plants that are pretty old and we're due for replacement anyways. Um, we have actually, uh, since 2005, over 2,000 megawatts that uh, has been retired or will be fuel switched to natural gas. We're also increasing um, the amount of energy we will have from highly efficient gas-fired units. Um, many of you are aware that we are moving forward with building a new state-of-the-art gas plant here in Wisconsin. So that will help us to meet some of the changes we have in the fleet with the retirements. Uh, we're also increasing the energy uh, produced, as we mentioned, uh, with renewable resources. Um, if you look today at our distributed generation, for example, compiled all the small solar and wind uh, units that we have, that's approximately 65 megawatts right now, and it's growing exponentially. Um, we have over 450 megawatts of wind purchase power agreements, and we own over 568 megawatts of owned wind sites, uh, including the Cedar Ridge Wind Farm, which is right here near Fond du Lac. Um, and then we are also continuing to do uh, energy efficiency. Uh, ener edge energy efficiency makes sense no matter what, and we're continuing to make sure we support uh, the Focus on Energy program is the main program here in Wisconsin. So all, all said and done, I, those are all, you know, things we're, we've been doing for a while, um, and actually in terms of reductions of CO2 to date, uh, since about 2005 we've reduced CO2 by over 15 percent, um, but there's going to be a lot of work to get to the 30 to 40 percent levels that you see in the rule, um, and it's going to take some time uh, for that transition. But we think we're in a pretty good spot. as as you see with our responsible resource strategy, that's part of that planning approach that we like to use to try to kind of prepare for what we see as a future um, and making sure we have a flexible strategy that we can have a variety of options to help us to comply. So questions? I see one in the back. Well, that's not necessarily an issue we, we get into um, in terms of uh, ourselves as a company. It's not part of our operations. Um, I, I know there's a lot of study going on with that and oversight in terms of the regulations, but we really, I would say we really don't have a hard and fast position on it. North. I would just add want. that it's not really an option for us either. Right. Uh, because we don't have oil resources here. Um, the closest carbon, potential carbon capture and storage location is is in southern Illinois. Illinois, yeah. And it's not really cost, uh, it's cost prohibitive at this point right. to even think about piping captured carbon, you know, up, I don't know, 400 miles or whatever right. it would take. For the most part, it's going to be a change in the nature of how your power is, is being produced. Um, and, and that's really what these goals are aimed at, not so much trying to have a kind of a back-end control. Any other questions? Just overall, how do we see this impacting cost mm -hmm. to, the, to the end user? Well, I, I would love to say that we have, have the dollar figure for you today because I am, everybody in our company is getting this question a lot. Um, so not getting too far down the road, uh, the, the good news is that as we talked about our responsible resource strategy, um, we are pretty well positioned here with our balanced portfolio in terms of the things we've already done. So we will have flexibility to comply with this final rule. The challenge is that we are not quite sure what those state plans will be 
uh, in the specifics. Uh, so there's a lot of um, uh, flexibility in this final rule, which is good, um, but it's almost so much flexibility, it's hard to know how we will uh, develop a state plan because there's many options. And I just kind of say, at the highest level, not getting into the technical details, there's one pathway that kind of focuses, they call it a mass-based approach, another one is a rate-based approach, and there's a lot of levels of detail for each of those. And so right now, we are working um, very closely um, with different agencies, uh, with uh, different EPRI, uh, the trade group on modeling, as are all the states looking at how we, we can put together a state plan and what are the best options. So until we have the details of the state plans, which really won't be due until uh, September of 2018, it's hard for us to really know the, the actual costs. Um, what I would feel comfortable telling you is that uh, the cost for us will be incremental to things we've already got in place. And we, we do think that we can keep them within a reasonable amount. But that's going to be contingent on our state plans, uh, including certain things that we want, uh, and in making sure we get credit for all the good things we've been doing. And so we're working very diligently to, to uh, make sure people are aware of the things we need in that state plan to make it effective for our customers. We'd just like to add that there, without getting into the details of this, there's an option for a federal plan if the state doesn't pursue its own plan. And we are strongly promoting that the state develop its own plan. Otherwise, you would be subject to the federal plan. Doesn't offer the state as much flexibility if you go with the federal plan. So we're other utilities as well, um, and maybe some of you feel that the state should be moving forward with the state plan. They're, they're not quite there yet. Um, that's in the works, hopefully. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Okay, and next I think we have ozone. Yeah, we talk a little bit about ozone, might be a familiar topic for some of you. Keep moving along here. So yeah, ozone. And I know that's a, kind of a big topic here in Sheboygan. Um, it's kind of the thing that never ends. Um, there's there's six pollutants that EPA sets standards for, and one of them's ozone. Now ozone's not something that's even directly emitted by our plants or any of your industries or cars. It's something that's formed in the atmosphere, typically in the summertime, and having the lake next door enhances it. Um, so EPA sets standards for uh, these six pollutants, which they call criteria pollutants. Ozone's one of them. And they're supposed to look at them every five years. They, they often miss that, um, but they eventually get to it. Um, sometimes they do it on their own. Sometimes they're forced by a court. But they've, they've done it in 1997. They did it in 2008. And they just did it a few weeks ago uh, in October of 2015. And each time, not surprisingly, the standard goes lower and lower and lower. So. Um, you know, we're tracking, we're, we're tracking this as we are all environmental rules. We feel that our, our company is pretty well positioned uh, for these rules. However, this is one that we'd like to keep tabs on um, because we know it can impact a lot of our customers. So we do try to stay engaged on it. There's really two pollutants that come together to, to form ozone. It's this NOx, nitrogen oxide, and then also volatile organic compounds, VOCs. And there's a lot of industries that emit those types of pollutants. So it can be pretty far reaching in terms of what this standard can impact. Um, and then motor vehicles as well and transportation plays a big part. And the tricky thing with ozone is it's known as a regional pollutant. So it can travel far distances. And as is well known here in Sheboygan, you can be impacted by not only your own emissions, by, but your neighbors and from other places far away. Um, there's a group out of Chicago that does some modeling um, LIDCO is the acronym, Lake Michigan Air Directors Consortium. They look at you know, who's responsible for what. And you know, their latest modeling that I, I had seen from their director was all of Wisconsin's emissions taken in whole is about 9% of the ozone in Sheboygan. Not, not just yours, but all of Wisconsin. Um, and when you look at like Illinois and Indiana, which is primarily like Chicago type region, you're talking roughly around 20%. So. A lot of it comes from out of state. You know, the, the regulators know that. Um, but if you get flagged as a non-attainment area, which means you're not meeting EPA's standard, then there's requirements that are put on you 
for being in the entertainment that, that apply to businesses in the area. So it's important to try and uh, keep tabs of this. Um, and then, as I said, EPA just lowered the standard. Uh, their latest level is 70 parts per billion. Um, Sheboygan has been really proactive of work, working with EPA regional headquarters and also Wisconsin DNR on getting some extra ozone monitors in this county. And, you know, we're supportive of that. Um, the one that was there historically and still is, is south of the city. Um, it sticks way out into the lake. There was one a uh, few years ago now that was put north of the city. So, you know, hypothetically, it would capture more accurately Sheboygan emissions um, and also a mile or two inland. And just this year, um, that monitor has been 17% lower. Uh, huge difference. Um, EPA typically looks at the fourth highest value over the ozone season, which is summer. Um, the monitor to the south was 81 parts per billion. That monitor to the north, 67. Yeah, and the standard uh, that EPA just lowered um, the level to is 70. So it's a huge difference, you know, just moving a mile or two inland, um, you know, maybe a farther north. Um, and it shows you Sheboygan, it's questionable how much impact that Sheboygan is having. So now with this new standard, EPA is going to, they've already started a process where they're going to try and define areas that are meeting and not meeting the standard. So I encourage you to be proactive with the WDNR, and we will as well. Um, typically, the states have about a year to make recommendations on what areas they think should be classified as non-attainment versus attainment, meeting these standards. And then EPA will turn that around and finalize it within the next year. So we have some time here in the next year or two to engage DNR. And I, you know, I think we want to point out some of the things we're seeing with the monitor. And we'll be doing that, and I encourage you to do that as well. Um, so one other way that these ozone standards impact us is not only are you dealing with potential non-attainment issues and you get increased permitting stringency in the area, but for utilities, we get the added bonus of uh, EPA looks and says, well, we want to try and do something about this transport of ozone. So if your, impact, if your emissions, your utility emissions, are impacting another state, more than 1%, that's what they, they model and say, if you're modeling more than 1%, we're going to um, set caps on your, your fleet emissions, basically your state, and then divvy up it's a cap and trade program, so they'll, they'll divvy out allocations to try and address this interstate transport. Now, mind you, utilities aren't th at all the only ones responsible for ozone, but they're kind of the easiest to set these programs on. So the cross-state air pollution rule is one of the ways they've gone about doing this. And they just actually released a proposal to kind of str make that more stringent. Um, so we're looking at that. We're planning on developing comments. Uh, and. You know, I'm sure other companies are as well. So, like I said, we're in pretty good shape. Um, NOx, we've reduced uh, uh, almost 60% already, and we have a, a goal of about 80. So, you know, we're making big reductions that are helpful, but uh, we're also keeping tabs on this for our customers. Any questions on ozone? Yeah? Well, those numbers you gave, the highest, or really the fourth high? The fourth high. So that would be a demonstrated attainment then? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they look to EPA typically looks at three-year average of fourth highs, but the fourth high for, at least preliminarily, um, for 2015 is 67 at that northern monitor. So. so, Joe, a question came in about um, how will these new rules affect our local businesses? You kind of hit on that. Uh, real quick, on the clean power plan, there's not a real direct connection between the clean power plan and local businesses from a compliance perspective. However, um, you know, there's things that we could possibly do together in partnership that could be beneficial. Uh, so I don't know if that's helpful as an answer, whoever had the question, um, yeah. but maybe on this one. Yeah, I mean, uh, ozone is one of those that really does have a direct impact, and that's why we try to keep tabs on it, um, if not for us, for our customers as well. Um, you know, Edgewater, we've put some state-of-the-art technology on one of our, the biggest unit there, and it, it often wins awards about being the best, one of the best in the country. So we're happy, really happy with that. Yeah, question back there? Um, I'm not sure if this is true or not, but is it, is it possible that the air quality can push up some stations higher or Oh, yeah, it definitely does. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. And it's really interesting kind of chemistry mix because in the summertime, the lake is a little cooler. It takes the lake longer to warm up. So it, act, it actually kind of traps some of those pollutants that come up from the south, from Chicago. And then they sit out there, and then in the summer, you know, sometimes they'll get a lake breeze come in, and it'll cool things down. 
not only is it bringing cooler air, it's, it's bringing some of that elevated ozone that was sitting over the lake and cooking. Um, some, some years you see some of the highest ozone up in Door County, which, you know, I mean, there's no huge industries up there, but yet they get a lot of ozone. So this is something that's transported really far. Um, so yeah, we do see that. But the important thing to keep in mind, though, is if areas get flagged as not meeting this, there's permitting restrictions that come to specifically those areas. So that's why it's important to track this. So. Yeah. Yeah. They should, yeah. yeah. It has three years now. I believe, I believe this last year would have been the third year. So, it was two. two so far. Okay. 2016 will be the third. Okay. Well, that'll be enough time for this next standard. Um, and I think they will. Um, you know, when I was at DNR, we worked with EPA down in Kenosha. Um, and what they did in Kenosha was they had two monitors and they really limited the size. They said, we're still going to designate you non attainment, but we'll, we'll scale it back a little bit. So, that's something that I, I would hope to see up here as well. So, yeah. other questions, or we'll move along. Some of uh, Steve's going to talk a little bit about some water and waste rules, um, and then you know other questions come up. We can get them at the end too. Oh, somehow I get to talk about waste. Um, no, it's actually a subject that I enjoy. Um, so. Uh, one of the things, another rule that we're following is the coal combustion residuals rule. I actually brought baggy, two baggies, one full of fly ash and one full of bottom ash. So if you've never seen it, uh, they're actually here. Is there? Yeah, dessert. Um, yeah, if you want to. Um, so for utility, when you burn coal, you're generating ash and actually when you burn wood when you burn pretty much anything you generate some kind of byproduct the byproduct for uh, coal is uh, fly ash which is very light you'll see it's a kind of a talcum powdery material and the other is bottom ash um, a lot of companies handle that material uh, wet uh, we do we handle our bottom ash wet uh, we also generate slag at one of our units at here at Edgewater we handle it wet um, there's constituents in the in the fly ash and, and bottom ash that can leach out and get into the water. So um, actually I'm talking about a different rule. This is coal, com okay. So this is why it's confusing because the next rule I'm going to talk about is the, a, a related rule and it kind of gets to the last bullet on this slide. There's multiple rules that come out and affect uh, pollutants and media in different ways. So we try to take this, as Michelle indicated earlier, this kind of long-term, pragmatic, holistic approach. When we look at solutions, we're not creating one that, you know, we're not solving one and creating another. Okay? So with the coal combustion residuals rule, where I was actually on track uh, was how we have to manage the coal combustion residuals once they're generated. Um, so this rule came out in April of this year, uh, highly anticipated, a um, lot, lot of discussion around what, what's going to, you know, what are the impacts going to be. So one of the things is uh, when you generate coal combustion residuals, they have to go somewhere. Most of our fly ash we sell for cement or concrete, cement, concrete. Uh, we also do take some of our bottom ash and it's uh, utilized for road projects, foundation projects, and things like that. Everything else has to be disposed. So one of the things about the coal combustion residuals rule was to make it so there's a standard across the country of how people manage this material. If it goes in a landfill, it's meeting certain engineering requirements. If it's uh, being utilized, it's meeting certain specifications for beneficial use. Um, in addition, if you're disposing of, of, of coal combustion residuals wet and into ponds, are the ponds meeting performance requirements? Do they have a liner? Do you have groundwater contamination? Is it stable? Is it safe? These are the kind of things that the rule addresses. And again, universally across all states. 
Fortunately, we have a great program in Wisconsin for handling coal combustion residuals. And so we've, when this rule came out, we, you know, there's some impacts, but they're not as severe as maybe other states. Um, but it does impact, potentially impact, uh, our active ponds. We will be monitoring groundwater. Um, we also have to do certain studies. And if some of those studies end up showing the instability of our ponds or the pond's not safe, then we may have to close those out. And that's what we are identifying here in the second bullet as a trigger event. Um, trigger events may lead to early closure of a uh, landfill or a pond. Um, also, any new landfills uh, being installed or constructed have to meet certain design requirements. And fortunately for us, we've taken that long-term approach again, and we've, we've put in those uh, more stringent um, design requirements and construction requirements several years ago. So again, not as impactful as it might be to others. Um, one thing that's very interesting about this rule, I'll point out the little box there, we have our own CCR website. So everybody's welcome to go in your spare time, of course. Uh, go look at all the documents that we have related to our CCR compliance program. This rule went into effect October 19th of this year. And we had to have a website up and running so that we can inform the public how we're meeting our compliance obligations. We're not alone. Every utility in the country has to do this. Um, so it's a new, weird kind of thing Instead of filling out a piece of paper and sending it to the agency, uh, we don't have to do that. Uh, we have to fill out the paper, post it onto our website, and now everybody gets to look at whether or not we're complying. So it's a very interesting aspect. Yes? So my question with what's in the bags, I, I interpret that one line as you can get rid of 75% plus or minus of the fly ash and the bottom ash. And yes. what you can't get rid of beneficially going into a landfill. Yes. Okay. Yes. And the question, the other question I've had as I showed these is, um, where where does this come out of the process versus Oh, us? the process. Is this so this is fly ash, and it's actually not Edgewater. Sorry, Eric. It's Columbia's. <laughs> uh, but fly ash comes, it's the lighter particle that passes through the boiler passages and gets collected in either uh, electrostatic precipitator and now we have a bag house so uh, there are pollution controls that collect this material it's gathered into hoppers and then it's loaded out to silos taken in trucks for beneficial use or for disposal the bottom ash so so this is handled dry so this is a good thing we have dry fly ash handling and you'll see why I say it's a good thing, because the next rule talks about water. Uh, the bottom ash, which looks kind of like a lava stone of sort, is handled wet. It comes, it's the heavier portion of, you guys in the plant, correct me if I'm wrong here, but this is the heavier portion of the coal combustion residual, and it drops to the bottom of the boiler, and it goes through some crushers, and then it's transported wet out to ponds, uh, generally. At Edgewater, it's we have a device called a hydro bin, so it's a, a mechanical separator, tanks and things where the water goes in and it separates out the bottom ash from the water. And we try to reuse as much of that water as possible. But most people just sluice it out to a pond and then dig it up and then dispose of it or beneficially use it. Was that helpful to those as far as process? First person with the hand up right there, yes. Uh, Eric, you want to talk about edge? Well, we burn around 3 million tons of coal a year at Edgewater, and 5% of the content of the coal is ash. So you have to do the math there. Yeah, and generally, I, if it's about a 70, I don't know, 70-30%? 70-30 and 80-20. Yeah. Okay, so 70% fly ash, 80%. Four hundred thousand tons of byproduct you reused, which was a seventy percent, roughly seventy percent rate. Right. So we generate a lot, and when we put in uh, dry scrubbers to control SO two, 
we generated a whole new, we created a whole new byproduct, um, which we're working on trying to find a, a better source. Yeah. It's a great, believe it or not, we're, and we're doing studies, so this is interesting, I, I, and I know we might be pushing time here, but uh, we actually are, are doing studies with UW on utilizing that material as an ag product because it has, a, as a liming agent, it's really good. Uh, and it also has a sulfur component, which the farmers like. So it's the, the beauty of our process is when you remove this material from that lime uh, scrubber solids waste, you now have a good scrubber solids material that you could market potentially and use as an ag product. If you have fly ash mixed in with that, not as good. So we remove the fly ash first. A very small amount carries through. It doesn't affect the quality or um, the reusability, I guess is a good word. All right. Let me try to stay on track here. Five minutes. Thanks. Uh, so what are we doing with CCR rule? Um, we're evaluating how we handle our ash systems. Um, we're looking at landfill options and like I said we are redesigning or, or re, um, really we've already designed our landfill so we're really just building our landfills with that uh, solid highly engineered design already in place. Uh, we continue to reutilize our uh, byproduct as much as possible um, and then uh, again we, we try to keep multiple rules in mind so let's go to the, to the next one just as, as because of time. The Affluent Limitation Guidelines Rule, it came out this year. It really addresses uh, wastewaters from utility processes. Wet scrubbers, ash transport water, so like the bottom ash transport water, wastewater from mercury control, uh, gasification, so if you take coal and gasify it, you may have a wastewater, uh, and then leachate from landfills. So we, we don't have wet scrubbers, we have dry scrubbers. So when we talked about how we plan for the future, we planned for dry scrubbers thinking that in the future, if we had wet scrubbers, we'd have to treat or manage that wastewater from the wet scrubber. So we don't have that. Uh, we have ash transport water and we have leachate. Even though we have mercury control systems, we don't have any wastewater from those systems and we're not gasifying coal into, uh, into a natural gas. We used to do that years and years and years ago, and uh, we don't do that anymore. So what happens here is the requirements from the ELG rule, um, they, they get incorporated into our wastewater permits, and the wastewater permits are on a five-year cycle. So um, with that in mind, the rule requires that we comply by November 1st, 2018, but no later than, so between November 1st, 2018, and no later than the end of 2023. So we have some time to comply with that, um, but I'm gonna talk again about a connection here because at our Edgewater facility, and the next area I'm gonna talk about is water quality standards, the next slide. There are other factors that might make you do something sooner here, but you have to look at this holistically. At Edgewater specifically, they received a wastewater permit with an arsenic limit that's very, very low. I mean, it's extremely low. It's 0.2 parts per billion. It's really low. So when we look at the CCR rule, when we look at the ELG rule, and we look at the wastewater permit limits that are coming in that permit, all separate rules, all with separate timings, we try to take that holistic approach and we say, what solution is going to work best? So at Edgewater, for example, we're going to be um, getting rid of the wet ash sluicing. It is a major source of arsenic. That's a great solution. It solves two or three of these rule problems, and the timing of that work will be contingent on whatever that first driver is. In this case, it's the wastewater permit and the water quality standards. So we are migrating to dry ash handling across the fleet. And we continue to look at, uh, you know, what is the most cost-effective way to minimize uh, discharges that could trigger uh, noncompliance with these limits. 
Okay, real quick, water quality standards, I kind of just touched on that. Are we still okay, Jane, with time? I think it's like maybe right on, pushing it? Okay, I'll go fast. Um, I kind of already touched on this, that we're getting lower limits in pretty much every single one of our wastewater permits. Anybody here have wastewater discharge from your process? Are you in the same boat? Yes. Feels good, doesn't it? <laughs> so, we, again, take this pragmatic, long-term, holistic approach to solving these problems. As you can see, multiple rules, solutions can fit and cover for multiple rules. That's really what we're doing here. Um, I'll kind of leave it at that. And, and Edgewater is kind of our, our classic story here in Wisconsin for how we deal with water quality standards, ELG, coal combustion residuals rule, it's, it's a nice package and, and the solution is that holistic solution. So we'll move into this last thank you slide and um, point out that we have an annual report, an annual environmental report, and it just recently got published. We put postcards out on the table out front. We don't in the, uh, in a solid sustainability effort, we don't print this. Uh, so you can get it electronically on our website and you can find the information out about this. You'll see lots of information on things we just talked about, how much uh, our pollutants have reduced, what our uh, fuel portfolio looks like, how much coal combustion residuals we use, uh, water consumption, there's a whole bunch, and a lot of good stories like peregrine falcon nests, uh, osprey nests, and things like that that we're doing all across our fleet. So we certainly appreciate the time, and uh, if, if you have any questions or want to stay, we'll be happy to answer those. I will be honest, we didn't think we would, we, we thought maybe we have 30 minutes to talk, but we filled up that hour really easy. <laughs> Steve, Michelle, Joel, thank you very much for coming up here and speaking with us today. We really appreciate it. Um, I'd like to make a couple of announcements about other upcoming events. We have a focal point. The topic will be well at work, really. That's Wednesday, the 20th of, June, uh, 20th of January. 7.30 p.m. Gene Kolb, wellness advocate, speaker, coach, and owner of Well by Choice will help us kick off a healthier and more productive 2016. Our next First Friday Forum, Governor Walker has been invited and has accepted the invitation. He will be here in Sheboygan. He'll be joining us to speak at the First Friday Forum. I see Jane looks a little uncomfortable because you never know how things will go with the governor if something else comes up. If something else comes up and the governor can't make it, we have another excellent program in the bag, Welcome just in back. case the governor can't make it. <laughs> but because we anticipate a, a much larger audience for the governor, we will have a change of venue next for next First Friday Forum. Uh, folks from the Elks Club aren't in here room, so I can say this. It'll be at the Blue Harbor. So watch for the invitation for that, and do watch for that change of venue. Uh, one other thing I'd like to mention, and my apologies to Greg because I'm not a financial advisor, but I'd like to offer you all an opportunity to save some money and help your own personal finances. If you would like to, you can sign up to come to all the First Friday forums for the entire year, and by signing up in one shot, you'll actually save about 20% on the cost of joining us every month for our First Friday forums. So do consider that at the Sheboygan County Chamber of Commerce's website. And with that, I believe that's all the announcements we have. And I'd like to thank you for joining us today, and thank you again to our speakers.